John, and today we're going to be exploring Avagachi. Our tour guide this evening is Jesse, aka Golden Cross, who is one of the co-founders of Avagachi. Jesse, thanks for being here tonight. Hey, thanks for having me, and uh, excited to chat a little bit about Avagachi with you. Uh, I like the idea of being the tour guide. That's yeah, a great yeah. way to put it. Absolutely. So NFT culture, you know, we started with artists and drops, and we've expanded into, you know, uh, the uh, avatars, and then it was avatars with utility, and now we're kind of branching into the game space. And you guys have always been a project that I've been following. So, you know, I'm really excited about the stream tonight, and we're going to get into lots of details. But before we do that, one of the things we talk about on the stream is make sure you understand the people behind the project, right? Their motivations, their commitment. And so I'd like to start by just getting to know you a little bit and kind of what first brought you to crypto. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I've been working in the space in various forms for the last most of the last 10 years and so, to some degree. So in 2013, I got into um, Bitcoin, discovered that, ended up, um, I was at law school at the time and ended up getting so obsessed with it that my uh, law degree, my, my thesis ended up being a bunch of research about global regulations and whether or not there should be any and how it should pertain to how do you regulate something like Bitcoin. So that was really, really uh, the starting point for me was more on the academic side. And um, from there, kind of I was working at Lenovo and uh, more the manufacturing side and then um, uh, ended up yeah, getting into it again when I discovered Ethereum is kind of like, oh, okay, now it's really getting interesting. We have smart contracts. Mm -hmm. And uh, next thing I knew, I had a meetup and I was hosting events and I was living in China at the time. And there was wow. a lot of uh, cross-border type of interest coming with different projects, uh, wanting to get into the Chinese market and, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So I was reading a lot of white papers and uh, editing them and, and that kind of thing. And, and, and you know, the the English as a second language type of uh, stuff came in handy oh, cool. uh, for crypto crypto in uh, China at the time. So, yeah, got into it there and the community building side and ended up getting involved with uh, an exchange called ZB. Not very famous outside of China, but actually to their own degree, they're, they're probably the largest and uh, second oldest exchange inside mainland China called ZB Group. And they're a big conglomerate now. They have multiple exchanges under their kind of uh, technology stack and, and brand. So. Uh, worked there for a couple of years, got to know a ton of projects by being on that kind of listing side and working with uh, coming into contact with every side of the industry. And it was always, you know, you, you get the mixed bag. Some are amazing, some are not. And some are obviously like cash grabs. And it's like it's, you know, it's a tricky part of the business. But then the ones that kept continually stand, standing out for me were the NFT projects, because this was very early. We're talking like 2017, 2018. Crypto kitties, it's yeah. like the Ethereum network. And it was like, all right, NFTs are cool. Um, and it was at that point, like some of the, the NFT stuff really started to get my attention. And luckily, very early on. So uh, I ended up leaving ZB to go full time and advise uh, NFT projects. Got to know Zach Burks at Mintable.app uh, mm -hmm. very early on. Ended up working with him for uh, about a year and a half, heads down, just working on Mintable and getting it, uh, you know, up and running and, 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 now today, I mean, I think they're doing a drop with Stan Lee today. They're doing great. So um, props to that. And, and that was kind of my starting point because of the idea of a no code solution for anybody can mint an NFT that didn't really exist before Mintable. So I was excited about that. And I was like willing to leave ZB to go work on that. And then um, kind of got obsessed with the idea of what if you had an NFT that's able to grab value from somewhere else on the blockchain? So you this whole JPEG argument, copy paste mm -hmm. argument just goes like stops dead in its tracks. I mean, it does anyway, but mm -hmm. if you start putting utility, like you mentioned, uh, avatars with utility, mm -hmm. once you start to get into that realm, it, it gets really powerful. So we were taking DJX gold tokens and staking them inside of really rare NFTs um, and calling what, them bullion X. What, what, what NFTs uh, was it? Uh, well, I'm not obviously not crypto kitty, but it's probably something you guys developed on your own or yeah, yeah. So we we developed a, a series of uh, unique smart contracts and mm -hmm. um, built out a product called Bullion X, like bu gold bullion with IX okay. on the end. Okay. And okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's really, really. Oh, um, that's really cool. Now that kind of it, it took me a minute to get there, but it's like then you put the value in there, and then it's it's got actual. It's like it's like a bar of gold. It's got actual value. Yeah. Yeah, and, and cool. I, I'm quite obsessed with like user experience too. Mm -hmm. So one of the areas with NFTs that I was kind of lacking, especially at that time, was just like okay, they're static. They're in a wallet. There's not a whole lot to do with them. 
So we had a really nice, we've got a nice 3D interface where you could let, you can like take your NFT, your bullion X and flip it around, pinch it, replicating the idea of holding a gold coin in your hand. I was like, spent a lot of time thinking about what do you do with a gold coin if you're a coin collector? It's like, oh, you hold it, you, you look at it, maybe get a magnifying glass out, you show it to your friends. That's yeah. about the whole, whole experience. So we replicated that with real gold in an escrow contract staked to it. And that uh, engine had done some stuff with that on their blockchain, but on Ethereum, there was no ERC721 that had ERC20 tokens staked inside of it at the time. So that whole idea just was fascinating from a technical perspective. And it, we knew that gold was just like a great starting point, but there's so many other applications for that kind of technology and that kind of approach to NFTs. So um, the sequel was already kind of underway and that ended up becoming Avagachi. Okay. where you have D Ave DeFi tokens staked inside of Avagachi. Cool. So my journey is pretty much three uh, three NFT projects and, and a whole bunch of crypto and Bitcoin related stuff leading up to that. Man, that, that's really cool. Okay, so you have kind of the perfect background for the project you, you ended up launching. Yeah, it was very iterative. Like one thing led to the next and, and one idea built on top of another. Was there was there a particular moment? So you're you're let's go back to the exchanges and you're looking at ICOs and, you know, was there a particular moment where you were like, okay, you know, Ethereum was really cool, but I don't know if it's going to work going forward. But then at that moment you were like, wow, this thing is really going to work. Was, was it crypto kitties or what was it for you? Ooh, that's a great question. Yeah. I mean, you, there probably was a point where you're a little discouraged. You're just like, this is a lot of really cool PDFs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, exactly. What's going to happen? Yeah. What's going to be the breakout that can lead to a user adoption is somewhere along the way, I became convinced that the NFT, maybe more than the financial side, mm -hmm. has that potential to cross over and, and be something that makes sense for everybody in the world. Like digital property makes sense in a digital age and you need something without middlemen that can secure it. So conceptually, I was totally on board with NFTs from the get go. And I think they really are kind of that building block. Like we have our money Legos. This is like our ownership Legos, digital digital ownership Legos or something. So it makes sense there. And I guess the moment it hit me was um, a few years ago, I was representing ZB. I was in New York for Consensus mm -hmm. and meeting up with an old friend. We went out to lunch and a um, bunch of people. And, and you know, he, he's one of those, he's a Bitcoin guy and he only has Bitcoin. He spends, he has all the apps so that he can just pay with Bitcoin and no, mm -hmm. no uh, US dollars or anything, no fiat. And uh, he was like, hey, man, I'm going to pay you back later. And he's like, um, I know you're really big on the Ethereum stuff. What if I paid you in something on Ethereum? I was like, yeah, that's totally like hit me up. And he's like, yeah, it's, I, I just have a bunch of crypto kitties. I really went in hard on those. <laughs> he's like, can I pick up lunch on and pay in uh, crypto kitties? And I was like, that sounds awesome. So I had like heard of them, follow the news, uh -huh. um, but I didn't have one myself yet. And so that was like really a cool experience and i ended up being like okay these are awesome you can even pay for lunch with a crypto kitty yeah so. the, the <laughs> nfts the the, pro, the uh the things bitcoiners love to shit on but they love as well right it's the uh yeah yeah ironically i was like oh he beat me to crypto kitties and he's like not a bitcoin maximalist but he's like you know bitcoin yeah. first and foremost which oh, I, I, get can, I can respect i get it, I get it. <laughs> All right, so so you've got this perfect background, and then you launch Avagachi. So just really high level, because we're gonna spend a lot of time getting into the details. But if you could just high level, give us an idea of what Avagachi is. Yeah, so high level, it is. Um, it's an NFT. It's a crypto collectible. You can think of it as a kind of 2.0 of a crypto pet. So one of the big design ideas around it was how do we improve on the path that Crypto Kitties kind of launched there, like this idea of well, if it's a crypto cat, crypto pet, is it really like, shouldn't a pet be more like a Tamagotchi and that mm -hmm. you take care of it and you interact with it. And so that was some of the questions that we started out with on a blank piece of paper when we started conceptualizing this. And so it's a, it's a crypto pet in the truest sense, mm -hmm. there's dynamic metadata. And all that means it sounds fancy. All it means is there's data inside that NFT that's stored on the blockchain that can change over time, depending on how you treat how you interact with it, literally with on-chain interactions. So no AWS server, everything is settles on the chain itself. And that means you have a perfect history of your interaction with this uh, crypto pet. So 
It's a few things. It's a 3D, or not 3D, it's a 2D piggy bank. Because you're, like I mentioned, you're staking um, Aave yield generating tokens inside of it. So you put, you know, let's say you put $100 worth of, uh, usually you put like DAI stablecoin inside. But with Aave, you put a lowercase a DAI inside. And that is the same exact coin, except it's generating the yield um, very, not intuitively, but just, um, you know, like you don't have to push any buttons. It just, you wake up tomorrow and there's 101. And next week you'll have 105. And so yep. those are accruing in your piggy bank that is an Avagachi. So it's a it's a piggy bank, it's a pet, and then it's also this, uh, like you said, an avatar with a lot of utility where it's a playable NFT. You can plug it into all sorts of different arcade games. Um, it's open source, so the community is massive and excited and, and talented, and they're building games around it already. We have a half dozen games live now. And, um, you know, imagine... Pac-Man, but we flipped the table and Avogachis are ghosts. Mm -hmm. So now the ghost is eating and chasing the, you know, the Pac-Man stuff. So all sorts of fun stuff like that. It's really, quite uh, empowering in that sense. Really, really cool. Uh, and we'll walk through some of those things later on in the chat. I just wanted to get through some like real basic terminology uh, because okay. there's there's quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, tell us about ghosts. What, what, what are ghosts? What is ghost? Yeah, yeah, I like how you pronounce it ghost. Some people still say GHST, which is the, the name of it if you go to CoinGecko, but uh, mm -hmm. I think it rolls off the tongue better to say ghost. Yeah. yeah, so ghost token is the eco governance token of the entire Avogachi experience. Mm -hmm. So if you are wanting to buy an Avogachi or if you are wanting to, uh, we have a lot of cool features like you can stake ghost to earn loyalty points and these mm -hmm. loyalty points can be cashed into win NFTs. Any of those type of interactions, you need Ghost in order to participate. So it's so for all the starting block. Go ahead. Okay, so 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 Ghost is yeah, it's kind of starting token. points. Like get some Ghost. Yeah, it's also the okay. governance token, which is that's why we, we were like, what do we call this thing? It's our currency in game, but it's also the governance token. So we have Avagachi DAO, and the whole project was bootstrapped by uh, starting a DAO. So it's a DAO from the start. Uh, we used Aragon <clears throat> to kickstart that. Mm -hmm. And so you can vote with voting power based on your your ghost balance. Okay. Okay. So so ghost is the token. Does governance? Um, what what is the? Because I want to talk about this because you guys have a unique mechanic for your ghost. It's not like there's a fixed supply of ghost and people can go out and speculators can can could get in early and buy them and then you know then obviously as the project became more successful then it was it was moon and FOMO and FUD and all that all that stuff. Tell me about the ghost. Tell me about the bonding curve mechanic of Ghost. Yeah, so this was literally the starting point about last September. So we're coming up on a year ago. Mm -hmm. We kickstarted the project, and um, we did it with a bonding curve that mm -hmm. Aragon offers as one of their many DAO launchpad templates. Mm -hmm. And um, you have some flexibility with how you want to modify it. And actually, they told me it's one of their least used uh, templates. So if you're considering launching, you should really check this model out. I think we've proven it can be very successful. and. Mm -hmm. And the idea is it was actually inspired by one of uh, Vitalik's uh, tweets last year where he talked about a fair, a fair, better ICO called a, mm. a DAO ICO or a DICO. And so what you do is you basically make a bonding curve. And all that is is kind of like your Uniswap or, or it, it's, it's like a big robot in my mind. And it just does one job. It says, if you give me this coin, I give you this coin. And, and and we don't have a big pre-mint, anything like that. We had a very, very small pre-mint so that we could bootstrap the liquidity. But otherwise, it's basically a one trading pair, die stable coins for Ghost. So people mm -hmm. can, you know, and it quotes you a price based on this literal curve. So mm -hmm. as supply increases, the price to mint each subsequent Ghost increases. So when we started, it was like 20 cents. You could put some die in and you would get, you know, a Ghost for every 20 cents you put in. And then, um, or 0.2 die. And then as, uh, as you know, as it increases and there's more supply, then the price of each one to create rises. So yeah, we love to freak people out and say, hey, there's, you know, what's the cap on this coin? We're like, oh, there's, there's no cap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're like, oh my God. It's like, but actually there is a cap. It's just, it's not a hard cap. It's, mm -hmm. it's capped by demand. And the other important part to keep in mind with this is as people in, engage with the the curve to mint more supply mm -hmm. uh, each one costs more their price rises but if they want to sell their ghost back to the curve they can do that 
it's, it's not like the curve just takes that ghost and sits on it. Each one is burned on the way in. Mm -hmm. So we actually have an ebb and flow of supply. Yeah. And um, from a, yeah, this was just something we thought would be a really powerful um, way to experiment with tokenomics and did a lot of readings, sought out a lot of advice and um, settled on this model pretty, pretty early on. And um, we have no regrets. It's been great. We have a, it's also been very powerful in bootstrapping a community around a token because they're there with you from day one. And so yeah. it's truly decentralized in that sense. Yeah. So just outside perspective, um, it, it, it looks like a, mecha a mechanism to kind of smooth that's for slow and steady growth, which everybody really wants. Nobody, nobody, I mean, of course, speculators and flippers want that, that boom and bust and they want to try to time the top, but ghost has got a nice smooth curve up. If it comes down, it's, I mean, it's just a, it's a great mechanism so far. Yeah, we call it cozy. It's very cozy. It's very cozy. It's yeah, yeah, slides yeah. Up and up. But I mean, don't get me wrong. Like even this last week, we've seen a lot of volatility. So it, it can totally do its thing when it wants to. But yeah. you're right. It generally um, is kind of like built to grow with the, the ecosystem in, yeah. in a healthy way. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we've got ghosts now. Let's talk. What's portals? Tell me about portals. Yes, great terminology. I love this. This is like going to be a must watch for people. Um, yep. Portals. So yeah, there's there's portals. That's your starting NFT with Avagachi. And mm -hmm. it looks like a, a, a closed door when you get it, like a, a dark black um, kind of rock. And then when mm -hmm. you open the door, there's like a purple glowing thing inside. So what is that? That is your portal to get an Avagachi. It actually is like getting a pack of cards Mm -hmm. and opening up your Pokemon pack of cards and seeing what Pokemon you have inside. That's really the closest metaphor I can give you So or analogy. So it basically is um, one portal. You open the portal. It's an, a 721 NFT. Mm -hmm. We use Chainlink VRF. It's a random number generator. So you're on chain again, randomly generating 10 Avogachis that have their own personality traits, unique mm -hmm. traits, rarity, all that good stuff. And you end up getting 10 Avogachis when, mm -hmm. after you open that portal. And then the, the twist is you go through those 10 and you can only keep one. So um, that, that at that point, you, you stake the Ave tokens into your new favorite piggy mm -hmm. bank, your Avogachi. Mm -hmm. The other nine disappear because they were just metadata on the NFT that's gone. And the same NFT transforms. So it was a portal. The metadata transforms and now it's your Avogachi. Okay. Okay. So, you, so it, on a technical sense, you have that same NFT all the way, but it starts as a, a tadpole, a portal, and mm -hmm. ends up as a frog in Avogachi. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Uh, let's talk about staking really quick because this is important terminology yeah. for your ecosystem. Yep. We also, being a kind of DeFi oriented NFT, mm -hmm. we see uh, it's really important to be also kind of educational and very mm -hmm. friendly for people to get exposure to DeFi and learn about DeFi farming and staking and some of those. You know, farming can really get somebody wrecked if they don't mm -hmm. know what they're doing. And so within Avogachi, we have some very friendly uh, staking mechanisms. And all that means is you you take your ghost balance and you can deposit it into a smart contract balance. It's like putting it in a bank account CD or something mm -hmm. and saying it's going to stay there. And while it stays there, you accrue these loyalty points I mentioned, which are called friends, F-R-E-N-S. And you use those friends for all sorts of uh, potential prizes, mostly raffle tickets, various types of raffle tickets. Okay. So that was my next one was friends. So you, so you kind of jumped ahead yeah. on that one. Um, yeah, yeah, they, they, go, they go hand in hand. So the friends are not ERC 20 tokens, which I think is really important for people to know. It's not a, not a crypto token. It's just a friends balance assigned to your wallet based on how long you've been staking. So okay. a lot of people get involved. They, they get a little bit of ghost. They can keep it on the exchanges if they want. But I think if you really want to play the game, your first thing is to go to avogachi.com, click on the little stake guy. There's an avogachi with a hard hat mm -hmm. and, and just put it there and accrue some friends points because um, it's really fun. And it's if you've never staked before, uh, it's a great kind of very safe and friendly first time experience for staking. OK. Uh, and Spirit Force. Yes. So Spirit Force is our way of talking about the Ave tokens that you need to uh, deposit into your Avogachi in order to bring it to life. So that's okay. kind of the, the, the one part is like, if you see those 10 Avogachi, you have, they all have different themes. So like maybe the rarest one, uh, of the 10 is themed as a link Avogachi. So it has mm -hmm. the blue link symbol and it's, it's a blue colored. 
but maybe you really, really want a USDT Avogadro. Maybe it, it could happen. And so you forego the rarest one in favor of that because you have a lot of Ave USDT and you can mm -hmm. just stake those in. That's you giving it spirit force so it can transform and come to life. So these, uh, these various tokens, spirit force that you use, these interest bearing tokens that you use to bring these Avogachis to life, you know, what, how much thought went into which tokens were going to be utilized, right? Because there is some value generation for those various tokens. Now, I think you guys have USDC, USDT, Link, and Aave, uh, Ethereum, and I think that's it, right? Those are the five that you guys have? And die. And die. Yeah. And die. Yeah, and die. And mm -hmm. die. Okay. That's it, yeah. Did you? So did, go ahead. The, the starting point was on Aave.com. If you go to their lending platform, Mm -hmm. um, we basically, whatever they support, then we consider supporting. And we didn't, they, they have a lot of options. So we did kind of go with the ones that either were um, partners we're working with, like Chainlink, mm -hmm. or their stable coins generally uh, have a better return in a lot of cases, not always, but usually. So it made sense to do most of the stable coins. Um, basically, you want to, whatever we chose needed to be easy to access and people could go to Aave and easily get these coins. So, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so you get your Avogachi, you uh, insert your, you stake your uh, interest-bearing asset, whatever it is, uh, USDT, USDC, die, and now you've got your Avogachi. You bring them to life. Um, let's talk about attributes. Like, what what are the attributes, uh, wearables yeah. and consumables, and let's talk about that. Yeah, yeah, and um, is it possible for me to share my screen? Maybe I can. Yeah, absolutely. This will be a great point to uh, take a look at Avogadro. Can you guys see this? I'm on the Avogadro yes. website. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. So I've just landed at the website. We see an Avogadro at the uh, bazaar. That's our NFT marketplace. But let's go find those traits you're talking about. So I'll mm -hmm. click on play. And I've got a few Avogadros on this wallet. Okay, my Avogadros are loading. There we go. Um, I've just doxed all my Avogachis. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> uh, um, so we'll go with my main one here, Golden Cross, is the same as my Twitter handle. And um, I'm going to stretch the screen here because the, the formatting is kind of funky. There we go. Okay, and you can see that uh, he's dressed up. We'll get to that later. But the traits are over here on the left side of your screen. You have a bell curve. And, you know, yeah. the bell curve is one of the best memes on the Internet today. Mm -hmm. It's like... Mm -hmm. And when we talked about starting this game, we pretty early on realized, oh, man, we got to use a bell curve instead of your normal, like, zero is bad, 100 is good, like, mm -hmm. just higher number better. So instead, if we view the traits here, you have energy, aggression, spookiness, and brain size. Those are your four personality traits. And then you have two visual traits, your eye shape and eye color. So I'll start with the first four because they're kind of the, the ones that are the most interesting and basically how it works is energy i have an 80 so let's go back to the bell curve okay it's really small now but i could enlarge this and i would see my i'm on the right side of the bell curve in this case with almost all of my traits but in other cases it's actually just as good if not better to be on the left side so on the far right side for uh energy would be like turnt like really really energetic like red bull style and then the mm -hmm. other side is like Zen, calm. So if you have a zero, one, two, those are just as good as a 98, 99, 100, like equal when it contributes to your total rarity score. Yeah. At the top, we take all these different traits and you end up with a rarity score. Mine is a, a four, eight, six. It's really middle of the road. And then if you dress it up with additional wearables, we'll get to that. You can see I've modified my, my score to 503. So I've improved the rarity of my Avogadro. Um, but yeah, my, my energy is energetic. My aggression is a 94. So that's war, considered warlike. And then I'm plus three from one of my wearables. So I'm up to a 97. So that's why I'm warlike and creepy and big. Yeah. So we have brain size. We have small brains that are actually very valuable. <laughs> you can't appreciate the small brains. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The, uh, the twist is the eye shape, eye color are the visuals. Um, you see my guy has two a die on his forehead. Each each one has their spirit force indicated on the forehead. But then the eyes are usually normal. In this case, he's got really weird logo eyes. And that's because his eye shape is mythical high. 
So once you get that high, it actually transforms into whatever the uh, the collateral of your Avogadro is. So he's got die tokens all over him. So um, okay. Yeah, but those can't be modified. Is it, is it the same? Is it the same if it's really low? Does the I transform into the collateral? Yeah, I would have a if it was like a uh, like this one's a ninety eight, so it's mythical high. If I had a a two or a, maybe even a three, it would be considered mythical low. And uh, different rules, different visuals apply for mythical low, but in terms of boosting your rarity score, it's also good. Okay, so so it doesn't necessarily transform into the die symbol on the low side. It might do something else. Yeah, it would be a totally different eye shape. So there's all sorts. Like if we go back, I've got a couple different eyes. These eyes are pretty good. These are like um, Let's see, these are rare high. So they're not quite mythical, but they're they're pretty good. And aesthetically, they're just one of my favorites. And, so, and this um, is one of the only things that you can't adjust with consumables. What you get is what you get on the on the eye color and the shape, right? Yeah. Or, so when you're you're evaluating things, you might be like, well, the spookiness is a little low, but I have some wearables that are gonna boost that anyway. Yeah. But if the eye shape is kind of middle of the road middle of that bell curve, you might be like, ah, you know what, I'm going to pass on this one because I'll never be able to boost those. So yeah, there's there's a lot of little strategies to consider. Yeah. So so for those folks watching, if you want to, you know, get an Avogadro, we'll, we'll talk about what the score does for you later. But uh, that's one place you're not going to be able to adjust. So when you're looking to buy one, if you're not going to do a portal summon, you're just going to go to the, the market or the bazaar and try to buy one of these things. Uh, you know, be aware of that. Those Those two features are are set now you can't hide them though right you can put glasses on top of them so visually you can change them you just can't change the score yeah you can change the score for the four personality traits but the eyes will always um be whatever they were when you summoned it exactly okay, okay. so yeah you can see a bunch of people here uh dressing them up and this one's a we call him nakey it's a nakey avogachi and uh his uh let's see i think we can check yeah here's his bell curve so like this one, the eyes are kind of in the middle there, right? It's a, it's a common eye color, um, just the base color of that particular USDT theme. And then the, but it has rare eye shapes. So it again, has that nice eye there. So, so, so you guys, just while you're on the screen, y'all's website is uh, just top notch in terms of everything's embedded and all the functionality is right there on, you know, on this uh, front end, um, mm -hmm. you know, did, did, do you, I mean, what does the, I guess, traffic activity look like? Does, is there any activity on OpenSea or is it all basically happening in the, uh, basically the, uh, lack the of better words, the bazaar, right? Is it all <laughs> happening there? It's all happening at the bazaar. No, it, it really is in most cases. Um, the bazaar is, for a number of reasons, the main home for Avogachis because it's so custom organized for all our various types of NFTs. You have the Avogadro, the wearables, consumables, raffle tickets. It's all kind of there. But um, yeah, I, we're working close with OpenSea. We, we really want to get Avogadro's more exposure and, and, and more convenience for options for our community. So um, there's just like one, without getting too technical, there's like one thing we have to fix before you can safely trade an Avogadro on OpenSea. You'll yeah. notice like Reboot here has a lot of wearables on, right? Mm -hmm. So we use a, a seldom used uh, a standard called the ERC-998. And it's really powerful. It's a bit gas in intensive, which is why I think it didn't get adopted much on, on Ethereum. But mm -hmm. what it does is it lets you have a parent NFT and then other NFTs that are linked to it. So wherever the parent goes, whatever wallet it goes to, everything will transfer with it. So it's really powerful in that way that I can sell you this uh, particular Avogadro. And even though the pants are an NFT, the, the steampunk goggles are an NFT, they'll all automatically go with because they're, they're safely linked together. But there's also possible that at the very last second a transaction goes through, uh, a very clever designer could do like a mini rug pull. And but what I mean by that is they could sell you let's say they went open and said here's my avogachi and it's worth two thousand dollars because it has all these other cool things on it mm -hmm. and then it when you get it you pay for it you just get the naked avogachi and you're like dude where's the where's the other nfts and he'd like remove them just before the transaction mm -hmm. went through okay. so this is long story short what we're working on with them and it's it 
there's going to be more and more projects coming out with this 998 standard. So it's just a matter of time that we kind of get it all like standardized and, and get it where we can do that. Um, we are working with one other um, platform on Polygon. Everything that you see happening is on Polygon. Mm -hmm. And um, that is Venly. Venly.market is a really cool. They just rebranded. They're actually the, the OG NFT market of, of Polygon. And uh, they just had a reboot with a really nice front end. And, and we're actually launching an exclusive wearable set on their platform like six hours from now. First time oh. ever. Awesome. Uh, it's the first time we've sold wearables outside of the bazaar and, and our platform. So we're are, super are, excited about that. Are those going to be commons, uh, uncommons, rares, mythicals, godlikes? What's the... Uh, it's a mix. There's four pieces. It's a four piece set. It's like a motorbike, like biker mm -hmm. gang Avogadro. It's really cool, really inspired set. And um, I think the rarest one available is a legendary. I believe mm -hmm. it's the uh, the horseshoe mustache. Yeah, it's really it's a grayed out horseshoe mustache. It's really cool. That's awesome. So that's, awesome. that's like legendary. And then there's a rare piece. And then the other two are fairly common. Yeah. What's what, what mechanism are you using for that uh, for people to get a hold of them? Is it is it going to be the raffle? Is it going to be uh, just the uh, your auction? It's, it's, so we love the auctions and the raffles for our distribution. In this case, we're trying out their just relaunched platform, and they okay. have their own NFT drop mechanism. So ah, okay. it's kind of playing by its own rules, the Venly market rules. So. Okay. Okay. Um, basically, it's all USDC denominated now. So mm -hmm. you go in with stable coins and, and make your purchase. Cool. So I think it'll be basically first come, first serve, but they have a lot of back end stuff so that we we shouldn't have to worry about bots and, and gas wars. Oh, so, thank goodness. Uh, gas yes. wars are terrible on mainnet and Polygon. They're a little more, uh, I guess yeah. you could say, palatable, but still, you know, the fastest to click is never the good mechanism. Um, yeah. And we'll talk about some of the mechanisms you guys have employed later, which uh, which I think are really cool. Uh, but let's mm -hmm. let's finish out kind of the uh, terminology here. There's lots of terminology, but we're we're talking about right now the Avogachi, and there's, we're going to save some for later because there's a lot more with the new uh, Gachi verse that's coming. So um, last thing is consumables. So let's just talk about the the wearables and the consumables. So the wearables, yeah. you can you know pin to your Avogachi, and they adjust your stats. Um, yep. Yeah, and you can see each one has the name and it says like plus two aggression, plus two spookiness, um, mm -hmm. negative energy, because sometimes you want to move left on the bell curve. So the mm -hmm. Imperial mustache will actually move you more Zen like instead yeah. of uh, all, all cracked out. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, that's wearables. And then consumables is um, a little less popular, but um, basically there are ways to boost some of the the traits. You We haven't talked about XP. But that is a really cool mechanism for emphasizing the community engagement over mm -hmm. your capital engagement. So too many NFTs are just like, well, in, gen in general with crypto, it's all about your capital investment, right? But with mm -hmm. XP, you're actually like, if you attend a community event, if you, yeah, basically participate in the DAO and vote, you will earn XP and it actually gets airdropped into your Avogachi. So your Avogachi is earning the XP on your behalf based on what your actions. What does the XP do? I mean, it is. Yeah. So if we go back to my Avogachi, mm -hmm. let's see. I've done a lot of DAO voting. So I'm a level four at this point. Okay. And that means I have 620 XP. I need 180 more to get to level five. If I get that 180, this button will light up and say, use the points. I use the points. And then it's really cool. I can look at my bell curve and I can choose to nudge one of my traits a little bit in one direction or the other. I can say, you know what? And, and again, it's everything except the eyes. So I could say, I want my brain power to increase by one. Okay. And um, so it's like, it's more the long game. Like over enough time, you can actually, uh, we're replicating real life, like through study and self-training, you can actually improve yourself. So um, outside of the wearables, this is the longer game to really evolve your Avogadji and, and uh, there could be other ways to uh, take these levels into consideration once it plugs into games. So arcade games or the, the Gachiverse realm, you yeah. could play with this on-chain metadata and, and do a lot of things. Yeah, so this this is, uh, I guess, the very first, uh, for me, um, connotation of a play to earn system. I mean, because if you participate and you play, uh, your Avogachi goes up in value as the traits go to the right or the left on the curve. Um, you can turn around, sell it, and you know that 
becomes more valuable. So that's really cool. Yeah, the savvy gachi collector will be very keen to know how much XP that gachi has, as well as mm -hmm. you know the. Uh, if I'll show you one thing here that's really cool. Very can can you can you stockpile your XP? In other words, can you know? Can you be like level ten and you never have actually nudged, so you can sell the Avogadro with basically the ability to nudge significantly that, in one direction or the other, or do you have is, to use it? No, that that's a there's a button there that says use the points, but you don't have to. So you uh. can accumulate and give somebody a lot of options. That's actually uh. a really good idea. Yeah, that's a good way to play it. And okay. um, yeah, you could do that. Um, so here I went, I went to something called the pocket. I mentioned that we use the 998 standard to link all these NFTs together. So all of these NFTs, even some that are currently not equipped are linked to this Avagachi. They're in its pocket and I can deposit more items, but then there's this other section we're starting to expand on now called badges, where these are also NFTs, kind of like the POAP badges everyone's uh, familiar with where you proof of attendance. We have badges for proof of whatever um, we'll announce like, hey, if you are participating in our game, our competition, you may win a badge. It's like a trophy. And the cool thing is these NFTs, you can get the info. It gives you a bit of history about what this particular Avogadro participated in. Oh, because, that's awesome. Yeah, because these can be um, airdropped into your Avogadro when they earn them, but it's programmed where it's never going out. Like it's non-transferable. So it's going to sit, this this particular badge is going to be part of my Avogadro forever. And because Avogadro's are 100% on chain, even the visuals are stored inside the smart contract mm -hmm. um, on Polygon. This Avogadro is going to live with this badge and any more it accumulates from now till as long as the Polygon blockchain is running. Yeah, so. Instacred. Instacred showing yes. how long you've been around uh, playing with your mm -hmm. Avogadro. Yeah. Reputation system overdrive. So yeah. yes. And it can awesome. hold the RC20 balances in its pocket. So the pocket is probably my favorite part of the Avogadro. That's um, cool. Yeah. That's really cool. But th these things don't modify your traits at all. This is strictly for, you know, cred, right? Yes, this is okay. cred. Yep. Okay. Okay. All right. So real quick, backtrack on consumables. Because you said it's you said it's not mm -hmm. as I mean, obviously people want the visual, you know, they love wearing the gear that moves them up or down. But, you know, also the consumables, maybe is it just the market price hasn't come to where it needs to be on the consumables where it makes sense to move the the trait or and, and also can you take consumables multiple times? In other words, can I can I buy one that increases mm -hmm. my brain size or decreases it over and over and over again? Can you do that? Yeah, this is probably the one part that I, I regret about the launch of the game. Being yeah. fully honest, I think most of the community agree. What we did is we did the, the launch and there was a bunch of wearables, the 10,000 Avogachis, mm -hmm. everything was, you know, available at the same time, first come, first serve. And the consumables were too. And the idea of a consumable is good. There should be a way to, you know, if if you neglect your Avogachi, this kinship score will, will drop. So this is going back to the, the pet part. So we have a kinship potion. If you your kinship's at like, you know, zero and you want to get back in the game, just chug a kinship potion and get a boost of 10. Mm -hmm. So you're like back in the game. But what really happened is somebody got their first come first serve and you had a very few amount of people holding, hoarding these potions. Mm -hmm. And so there's not much volume on the market for these because they're really pricey. And if you want to boost your kinship to really high levels, you could chug kinships potions one after the other. And so for the first round of rarity farming, where you actually get paid to climb leaderboards, um, people who had the kinship potions or the XP potions did enjoy, um, you know, they paid for it, but they ended up climbing that leaderboard more than they probably should, especially the XP, because that's really supposed to be indicative of your engagement with the community and the DAO. Yeah. So that part, we, we haven't minted anymore. Mm -hmm. But I think to balance things out over time as the uh, we have a, a virtual world metaverse coming mm -hmm. and as that game comes out, there's going to be more ways to earn or win these type of potions as opposed to just buying them on a first come first serve drop. Yeah, we yeah, won't so, do that again. There's always some bad apples. I actually, uh, yeah, I actually participated in that initial drop, by the way. And oh. uh, I remember I didn't I got priced out on Avogachi's. I was I, on the portals um, and uh you know, 
I should have, I, there was a, I remember there was a deal where it, I didn't authenticate before. And so everybody authentic that authenticated before, you know, they were ready to buy instantly when it started. So everybody that all the poor saps that didn't do that and had to authenticate the transaction and then actually buy it. There's a two step, right? This is a hint to people yeah. moving forward. If you get the authentication done beforehand. It gives you a leg up. And unfortunately Definitely. I got, I got priced out. And those portals went up really quickly in price. So, oh yeah. Yeah, the floor is, and even recently, the floor is rising again. So I think part of it is because our DAO recently approved a second haunt, mm -hmm. which is a second group of Avogachis and wearables that will be dropping in a, a couple weeks from now, maybe three weeks from now. We don't have an exact date, but definitely in August. Okay. And um, unlike the one you just described, which was frustrating for too many people, um, it was successful in that you know, it sold out very fast and everybody was, you know, was sold. But it was not successful from my point of view because too many longtime community members left with with nothing to show for it even though they had the ghost token they were there it's just like the fastest the luckiest whatever it may be like it, it's frustrating for the majority of people by the nature of the design of a first come first serve mm -hmm. uh, so we're not doing that we're doing a, a bid to earn auction that you you know yeah. um, gives everybody a chance to have some fun and, and get involved We'll talk about that. All right, so let's uh, let's move on. Let's talk about some of the mechanics. We've got the terminology. Let's talk about some of it. Let's talk about rarity farming because you mentioned that, but maybe explore that mm -hmm. a little bit deeper and kind of rehash that because it's an important mechanic in the game. Yeah, um, usually when we have a season, it's the off season right now. When we have a season, it'll be right here in the middle. And it's basically, um, currently it's three leaderboards. Next season, we'll have a few extra leaderboards. Mm -hmm. And we're going back to those traits. So it's Basically, you're climbing leaderboards. Everything's on chain. So we're simply looking at your Avogachi stats as compared to others okay. and where you fit in that. And then what we do is when we have that sale um, that we mentioned where we sold the Avogachis, a significant portion, I believe, yeah, 40 percent of all the revenue from that sale goes immediately back to the community into a wallet for a rewards pool. And then that rewards pool gets redistributed redistributes that goes to all the Avogachi owners over the course of that season. So we had over, I think it was 1.3 million ghosts, which is about $1.3 million uh, worth of rewards redistributed to the uh, the Avogachi owners. There's 10,000 Avogachi, uh, 7,000 have been summoned. And so you're looking at about 7,000 Avogachis farming ghost tokens by simply playing the game. That means petting your Avogachi to boost your kinship score. That means voting in the DAO or joining our Discord events to boost your XP score. And, um, oh my gosh, I'm waking up here. What's the third category? Uh, oh, your base, the big one, your base rarity score, which is this guy right here. So that's the most capital intensive one. So it has the majority of rewards go to that. That basically means you found an, a really rare Avogachi. Maybe you bought a lot of portals, you found the rare Avogachi, you got some really nice wearables that are powerful and boosted that score. Now you're at the top of that leaderboard and you get a big payout. I mean, if you're at the top of the base rarity score, um, we do rounds every two weeks. There's a payout. The top guys were farming like $20,000 worth of ghosts each, each round. It was pretty insane. And so it's off season. Now we'll have a second season that follows the, uh, the haunt Two sale, um, a couple of weeks from now. So it'll be kind of the same thing. The, the a very large 40% of the revenue will go into a pool. And um, there's a cap. I think we, we want to be able to fund multiple seasons. So I think $2 million minimum is going to be reserved for the next season of rarity farming. And um, that's kind of how it works. It's like climb leaderboards, uh, probably over an eight week period. So four rounds mm -hmm. and see how you can do. All right, so this the leaderboard score. The top is based on your your base score, then all your wearables on top of that, and then mm -hmm. uh, you know whatever potions you're chugging, and that's basically uh, you know and and of course the kinship goes into that as well. But um, yeah, yeah, it's three it, distinct. Uh, to keep it easy, it's three distinct leaderboards. So okay. you could you could have you know you maybe don't have enough capital, so you can't play the base rarity in a significant way. Like you can place, you'll, you'll farm some ghosts, but you're not going to be like top 100. Okay. But you know, you, you're engaged, you're petting your Avogachi twice a day, which is the max. You can pet it every 12 hours. I need a pet right now, actually. Um, let's, let's pet it. So, <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm going to be in trouble here. So going to pet it. 
There he goes. He's happy. Um, and so you just do that. If you're like dedicated, then you're going to climb the kinship board instead. And you're going to farm with that. If you're voting in the Dow, you're going to climb the XP board and farm there. Okay. So it's pretty cool in that sense. And all the ghosts you earn every two weeks, you'll find it deposited directly here in your ghost balance. Like here, I have 71 ghosts sitting in this Avogachi. That's all from rarity farming. That's I could awesome. withdraw it to my wallet. But we get the comment often. People do get attached to their gachis and they say, you know, my Avogachi works so hard for these 71 ghosts. I, I kind of feel bad if I just like withdraw it and like take his money. It's like his lunch money. <laughs> <laughs> Tell him so. he can reinvest and get him some new uh, duds. So exactly. It's for his own good. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. So what else? We got uh, the gacha mall and the bazaar. So let's. Uh, yes. What, so what is the, the gacha- mall? The mall is where we did that first drop. It's kind of the primary market and the yeah. bazaar is the secondary market. Okay. But um, okay. going forward, we're going to be doing the auctions. So the mall is actually being uh, um, discontinued for till further notice. We demoed. For, yeah, it's being demoed. We're going to build up an auction house there instead. And so you'll have the auction house uh, with, with these really cool auctions. And then if you want to, uh, we were looking at this earlier, you can you can buy and sell and trade any Avogachi NFTs in the bazaar. Cool, cool. So it's a P2P marketplace. Unlike OpenSea, it's, it's 100% on-chain marketplace too. So it's kind of, uh, we've thought about listing some of our partners' NFTs, but it's, it's doable, but it takes a little bit more integration than we first realized. So for now, we're completely focused on Avogachi, but... Yeah, Alpha Leak. We may we we do have some partners. We'd love to eventually list their NFTs as well. Oh, so okay. Um, mini games. Let's talk about the mini games. You, you mentioned this earlier, and these are yeah. uh, not done by you guys, or not done. Uh, they're, they're community projects, right? Yeah. So in our Discord, we have a, a ton of talented people, and there's a couple different groups, and and one of them is the Architects, always spelled with two A's. And the Architects are any indie game developer, hobbyist. Again, we have people that have never made a game before and and figuring it out or partnering with people in there because they have the ideas and they're making these really cool arcade games. So we have Gachi Tower Defense and we always credit who made it. Um, It's also on our wiki, wiki wiki.avagachi.com. You can see all the games in the background on these. These are really fun. Um, Snake is like a, you know, the old no phone game, um, very and the, the thing is, you can only play them if you have an Avogachi. And you can, um, uh, some of the games are very cool because they'll take the traits of your Avogachi and it will modify your experience in the game. So, for example, Sushi Vader, and I don't think you can see this because I switched tabs, so I, I won't play now. But um, Sushi Vader is like Space Invaders. And the amount of uh, attacks you get and the speed of your ship all revolve around the traits of whatever Avogachi you choose to play with. So we did a really cool thing where you would climb leaderboards in these games. And if you placed, you would also farm some XP to, oh, that's to awesome. level up your Gachi. Mm-hmm. All right. So you're, you're incentivizing the community to continue to grow and develop and build. That's uh, yeah. that's really cool. Yeah. We're, we're looking into, and we'll have some news soon about a, a really big initiative to double down on this. We really, uh, we see the talents there. We want to reinvest in the community and support them to continue creating these games. These are all fairly simple. I'd say Gachi Tower Defense is the most complex and original. Gachi the Gatherer is another great original that you're like racing around to gather the various wearables. Uh, but they, there's so much more that can be done. And I know in the Architects channel, they have a lot of, you know, it gets more ambitious week by week. So we're going to support that more and more. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, so, you know, here's, here's the inflection point. So you've launched, uh, you've got a very vibrant community. You've got... Uh, outside developers building uh, games for people to use their Avogachis in. Um, but right now, the mechanic is rarity farming is the game. Um, and so this te- this brings us to the next step, which is the Gachiverse. So I want to spend some time on this. This is really exciting. Uh, so high level, what, what, are we, what are we looking forward to? Yeah, so the Gachiverse is our answer to virtual worlds that are backed by blockchain, secured by blockchain. So if you're familiar with Decentraland, The Sandbox, CryptoVoxels, these are all very popular games where you actually, the real estate in the game mm. is is a, a 721 NFT. And what happens is if you own that NFT, you own that land and the rights that come with it, which is usually the rights to build on the land, right? Like 
like a Minecraft where you own this parcel and you can do whatever you want on that parcel. There's a neighbor on your right and left. Okay. Um, the product market fit for a lot of those so far has seemed to be NFT art galleries, right? You have a, you build a place to showcase your NFT mm -hmm. collection in a virtual world. Makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense. Yeah. The other um, use case is basically meetups, online meetups. So it could be a very fun environment. And I've attended many a crypto voxel meetup that uh, are, are awesome for knowledge drops. And it's, it's a totally different experience than doing a Zoom call. So it's, it's a great way. Uh, both of those are great ways to use virtual worlds. What we're looking at, though, is we said Avogachis are playable NFTs. They're actual game characters. They look and feel more like Mario than maybe a something else like for a meetup. So we said, we're going to make a real game. And we always wanted to from the start. Now we've grown out our studio. The My, my team is called Pixelcraft Studios, and we've got us up to about 25 full-time staff now. We just brought on a technical advisor, former CoinMarketCap advisor, um, uh, CTO of CoinMarketCap just joined us. We're, we're really boosting the talent and bringing in people, veterans from the game industry to really make this a proper computer game, video game, in every sense. So we're so Jesse, real quick, uh, I yeah. should have asked you this earlier because it's really important. Like, you know, with Ethereum, you have the Ethereum Foundation and then you have consensus and you have various mm -hmm. entities, you know, building infrastructure and things in the Ethereum ecosystem for the betterment of the, the you know, the whole environment for the whole blockchain. Yeah. It, it, for you guys, you've got the DAO, uh, but then you mm -hmm. also have Pixelcraft Studios. Are there any other players in there or, or basically Pixelcraft is the engine you know, for lack of better words, um, uh, the, the yeah. business, the business side that's going to make this thing go. Yeah, pretty much. Pixelcraft is the business side, the dev house, the, the core team. And then the DAO, um, probably one of the most active DAOs in the world, by the way, we, because we're not dealing with like a protocol standard that, you know, isn't supposed to move very often. The DAO is voting on game mechanics literally every week. So many proposals, growing treasury, they get revenue cuts from all the actions that happen in the game and the website. So yeah, it's pretty much a, a two-party marriage to make Avogadro happen. And it's it's the DAO and Pixelcraft. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, all right. So so you got the gachi verse. Um, and you have the land. Um, mm -hmm. tell me about the types of land that you guys have. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll share my screen one more time again. Yeah. And um just a few weeks ago we published the light paper for the the Gachiverse realm. Mm -hmm. So you'll notice it starts with a prophecy. So when was the last time you had a light paper start with a, a prophecy? And um, so it's very lore heavy uh, mm -hmm. relative to the uh, other games I was just talking about, the, the kind of typical virtual world that we're used to. Yeah. So it's, it's part virtual world, part DeFi RPG is mm -hmm. how I would put it. And so you can see the treasure map here, not to scale, but this is the overview of the world you're, you're jumping into. And it, we really want to do something otherworldly and you can have, yeah, ownership in this virtual world that is called the realm. And so it's kind of broken into two parts. We have two gameplay modes. The Citadel you'll notice is um, kind of its own thing, about 20% of the map. And then the rest is what we call the grid. It's kind of the wild vaporwave grid. Inside the Citadel is going to be a bit into the Decentraland. The, there, there's not going to be any like danger per se most of the time. It's more like build, uh, have meetups, and, and farm. We'll get to the farming. Mm -hmm. But on the outside, uh, you have a different gameplay experience where there's more um, competition, basically, I guess would be a good way to say it. Mm -hmm. Because what you're going to be competing for is yield. And we wouldn't be... Uh, it would be right for us as a DeFi product to not have yield involved in some way. So we really want to take the idea of owning the land and, and farming to that to that obvious conclusion where my parcel has some value inside of it that I can extract through playing the game. Again, not through just capital, but through playing the game and engaging with it. So if I scroll down here, you'll see we have three different parcel sizes and... Um, humble, reasonably sized, and spacious. And uh, these are the different alchemica that can be farmed from your parcel. And uh, so if you're adjacent to rivers, you're probably going to be looking for this blue alpha. If uh, you're near the mountains, you're going to be looking for kek. If you're near the volcanoes and lava fields, you're, you're farming FOMO. 
And if you're in the, the forest, the dark forest, you're probably farming FUD. And uh, in truth, you'll be farming all four, but there's like bonuses and boosters based on what's in your vicinity. So that's why it's really important to actually consider where your parcel is placed, location, 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 and not just like everywhere. And, um, and then each of these is technically a ERC-20 token, just to be clear. So you're farming actual tokens that are interoperable with all of Web3. So uh, you have Ghost, and then you have these four new ERC-20s. Um, are these ERC-20s also going to be, can I go and pick them up on SushiSwap? And, you know, are you guys, uh, is that going to be possible? Or what's, what's you know, outside yeah. the, the Avogadro? I mean, it's ERC-20, so obviously it, it could be. Um, it could be. Yeah, there's no stopping it. I wouldn't be surprised if you see liquidity popping up outside. I know internally we're going to be launching with a uh, dedicated DEX, wow. like an in-game DEX, so that if you want to, uh, maybe you're you're over in the volcano fields, you really want to, you know, you have too much FOMO, you don't even know what to do with it, and I've got a bunch of FUD, we can we can trade very seamlessly. So, um, yeah, there will be a DEX, and um, then if you LP, there's also rewards for that, a final token. Why do you want all these uh, FOMO and Keck? And why do you want these alchemical? Yeah, what do they do? Because, yeah. So one of the games we're taking inspiration from is Clash of Clans. Probably the most successful mobile casual game, mm -hmm. right, of the last 10 years. So it's like, okay, let's take a look at that. And so it's it's we want it casual and approachable. You have your parcel. You can still just post your favorite NFTs and do that kind of thing. Or you can uh, use your space to put these different installations. So what am I talking about here is if you've played Clash of Clans, you place things on top of your land to uh, harvest various minerals. Mm -hmm. Like there's the gold mine and that kind of thing. So that's what you're doing here is you're actually um, you crafting. It, there's also a crafting element. So you need three pieces of FOMO and two pieces of FUD to create a, you know, a, a alchemical harvester so that you can farm it more faster. So like if you don't have any installation, you farm it very slowly. In fact, your Avogachi comes into play and has spend its kinship score. You're abusing your, your Avogachi. So the kinship score drops through hard manual labor and he farms the Alchemica. But if you build a harvester, it can pa passively farm this over time. And, and uh, you can level up your harvester just like you do in some of these Clash of Clan games. You, level up to maybe a level eight or nine and farm it as fast as you can. Okay. So yeah, there's going to be a whole kind of uh, at, uh, game loop built around and, and, uh, and there's, installations. There's another, is it an ER, another ERC 20 that is just the, the yield from the land you guys that Alchemica that's, that's, uh, that's an ERC 20 as well. Um, so yeah, the, the four Alchemica you're farming are oh, no, no. ERC 20. And then here we get to the GAX, the, the, uh, okay the 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 decks and okay. if you liquidity provide there you'll farm something called glamour or glmr it's the it's a terrible name glamour <laughs> but glamour is the one that helps you speed up your farming as well your installation building so it's one thing to craft it but it takes you know there's a build time like how many mm -hmm. blocks on the blockchain to complete it so you're not just buying installations um, just like in Clash Clans, there's a time limit. So it's like, all right, I got to build this. It's going to take me 24 hours. But if I have some glamour, I can spend it and maybe I can eliminate some of that time and get back to work. So this is how you guys are going to uh, basically incentivize the liquidity providers for the decks you're building with this. Yep. Yep. With in -game bonus. Token. Okay. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Really, really cool. Okay. And you guys have uh, various parcel sizes. Right. There's there's three different sizes and they and the amount they yield is different. Is that did I read that right? Yeah. So size of your parcel, there will be more or less of the Alchemica, quote unquote, within that parcel. Mm -hmm. And the way it's probably going to work is you're going to go into the map. You're going to see a parcel you like. And on the sidebar, it's going to give you a readout of basically your odds of having more or less of each of those four Alchemica based on what's around it. So it says, okay, you're near a volcano, you have a plus two uh, boost to FOMO, but you don't know exactly how much you will have until you've already acquired the parcel because it would be a lot more, it would just be pretty boring if you knew exactly what was inside of each one and then you just you know, bought it and you're like, well, it has a million FOMO inside it, I'm gonna pay 
X amount. So what happens instead is you have some inputs. You know the size of your parcel, so you kind of know a range. You're going to mm -hmm. be lucky or unlucky. Mm -hmm. You know what boosters you have, so lucky, unlucky. And then once you own it, you your very first act with your Avogadro will be to put your first installation, which is called the Alchemica Altar. And you use this altar to um, basically connect to Chainlink again in the random number generator. And that oracle is going to take in all your inputs and then deposit the appropriate amount of, or yeah, deposit the appropriate amount of the four different alchemicals. So you might come away with three out of four. You'd be like, I have no FUD, but I have a lot of FOMO and uh, alpha. You're like, okay, that's pretty good. So it's gamified. Yeah, you'll, you'll see what you get at the end of it. And it could be, uh, again, on a bell curve, it could be really good or it could be like eh, a little less than I expected. So you guys, you guys have up upcoming. It's a, it's an auction uh, or or the raffle. Which one is upcoming for the actual realm scrolls that that uh, will determine the various parcels? Is yes. It the... Oh, look at this one. That's a FOMO. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so we're going to have uh, a haunt two this month, August, or this coming month, August, and then we see how that goes. We if if uh, the auction model works like we expect it to, we'll probably continue that in September with the first pre-sale of auction or first it's actually an auction of a first auction of these ground parcels and they'll be okay. all within the citadel no outside grid stuff yet it'll be the citadel citadel is kind of phase one and we hope to have this game live by the end of the year that's our target is like christmas of this year and so when that happens it'll be just the citadel live and again it comes back to the lore uh the rest of the world will open up in q1 q2 of next year so it's like comes it gets released in phases uh, but right. yeah first first sale in september so the first the first sale you guys aren't you're going to do the uh the auction and not the raffle so the so the auction oh, yeah you're going to have these is it just going to be like generic uh is it going to be the parcels or is it going to be scrolls that you don't know whether or not you're buying a small medium or large parcel or is it you, like you'll know but you won't know how much they're going to yield because yeah, you'll a, know exactly you'll know everything except the exact yield amount so okay. you'll know the size of the parcel, the boosters, all the inputs are totally within your control. And then it's just a matter of um, what that final uh, amount is when you when in December you can go in and engage with the the chain link VRF. Oh man, that's so, so cool. And so in December, you know, because there's a, there's a little bit of element of randomness there, even though you go and buy a large parcel, you know, theoretically maybe uh, Correct me if I'm wrong. It could be where you bought a medium parcel, and based on its location, you're getting, you know, more value. Um, but you won't know that until you know uh, once the VRF actually shows you what it's going to be producing in December, and then you could potentially go list that and sell that parcel. But now the properties are known at, at that point. Yeah, exactly. It's very similar to our gameplay loop with you buy a closed portal. You don't know mm -hmm. what's inside what ten, or you can mm -hmm. buy an open portal where the 10 Avogadro are already revealed. So it's mm. like, oh, I know what's in here. So yeah, kind of same idea. It's like, these are closed. Um, you know the inputs, the size of the parcel. So you have, you can have fair expectations. There's like a range that's reasonable and it, it shouldn't go outside of that. Okay. But um, there's some room to, room for surprise. Cool. Okay, so a lot of people viewing uh, are probably not familiar with the auction mechanism you guys just uh, tested. Uh, so if you could mm -hmm. just talk about that for just a minute, that's a, it was a really, really cool auction. Yeah, um, it was probably the most fun I've had in crypto all of this year and maybe ever. It was yeah. so good mm -hmm. and and so huge success. What it was is you we had an auction for a few uh, different items, like mostly wearables, all wearables. And what in this case you would do is the the drop went live and you could go in and you could vote. Uh, sorry. So tired, I just woke up. You could basically bid on whatever you want. And um, if you got outbid, you would end up actually getting a payout. So this is called bid to earn. So it made it really fun because everybody was jumping in and clamoring to get those bids in. And then if they had got outbid, sure, they don't get the NFT, but they probably collected some ghost in the meantime. Because when you bid, you have to commit your capital. So there's like your your hundred ghost goes in, somebody outbids you at 120, you end up getting 105 back, and you're like, wow, that's pretty cool. Now I have more to go bid on something else I really want. 
And so it was successful in every way in that things were more evenly distributed, but it was also successful in that the community just had a lot of fun. Like the discord was on fire yeah. and everybody, you know, was rallying around their favorite items. And also very importantly, this really defeats the bots because instead of trying to outsmart bot designers, you're just absorbing them saying, yeah, the bots can participate if they want, but they have no advantage because a bot's advantage is speed. Mm -hmm. And here it's an auction and we have the uh, stoppage time or the hammer time at the end. So they, they can't slip in in the last 10 seconds and, and swoop it from you. If there's a bid in the last 20 minutes um, that comes in, it was a three day auction. So if tw in the last 20 minutes, somebody came in with a bid and I'll bid you, you would have an extension of an additional 20 minutes to uh, to re return the favor. And it, it could go on and on like this with hammer time. And I think the longest hammer time we had was like four and a half hours over a coffee mug, an Avogadji coffee mug. Uh, <laughs> it just kept going back and forth. So it was, it was really fun. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, the, the, I, I actually participated in, in the whole experience was just a blast, right? Because it, you have that gamified element. Like if I bid too much, then you know, I'm stuck, but maybe I could bid. A lot of times you bid on a couple pieces that maybe you didn't want, you wanted something else. And so you were playing that game, but you got stuck with it and, and nobody else wanted it. So it was a lot of, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah, definitely some strategy. There were still ways to get wrecked. You know, there's all, it's crypto. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. But it was like, yeah, worst case NFT that you hit on. So yeah, it all kind of worked out well. And um, cool. everybody after that, that was our small scale test. I'm glad you liked it. Um, yeah. It, it, I think it's going to be even more interesting when we do this at scale with, um, so there's 15,000 Avagachi in Haunt 2, 80% are going to be in the auction. So that's okay. 12,000 live auctions happening all simultaneously. It's going to be a madhouse. And then the other, the red, the remaining ones will be in a raffle, which um, is really cool. That's where we go back to staking your ghost and earning those loyalty points called friends. If you uh, have accrued those, you can cash them in for these drop tickets you see here on the screen. These, yeah, um, those, black those, those realm magic. tickets. Is that is mm -hmm. that is it say, say drop or say realm? Are they called realm tickets? Or they're, it... they're called drop tickets as in like okay. NFT drop. And they are, um, with a drop ticket, you can win one of two things. They are portals in the Haunt 2 uh, raffle we're gonna do. So we're gonna do the auction late August and then immediately after we're going to raffle off the remaining few thousand. So and so this is for the hunt. Lucky, this is for hunt too. This, it, this doesn't it, have anything to do with the parcels of land yet. Yeah, on screen, I'm showing you the parcel of land, so it's a bit confusing, but um, it actually works for both. So for order of operations is we're doing um, haunt two first, and okay. we're doing a, an auction for haunt two, followed immediately by a raffle for haunt two. So if okay. you have these tickets, you can participate in the raffle and maybe win uh, some portals for free. Okay. And then in September, we're going to, you know, take lessons learned as always iterate, and then hopefully be back for uh, the first realm presale, which is technically an auction as well. And that will be uh, a same thing. It'll be the auction immediately followed by a um, realm. You could win realm with your drop tickets. So if I you have drop tickets, you can either save them for the portals or save them and use them on the uh, trying to win the, the realm parcels. Okay. I, I don't know if this is the case, but I thought I saw something earlier um, in Telegram where somebody mentioned where you could convert some of your uh, other tickets to drop tickets. Is that is that right? Yeah, uh, that is true. So we have um, a bunch of other raffle tickets from previous raffles that are for wearables where we have based on rarity. So the, the rare ticket, the legendary ticket, mm -hmm. and that still exists. We're going to do one of those raffles soon, too. So, but some people, because we just introduced the drop ticket for Haunt 2 coming up, it's brand new. So if you had spent all of your loyalty points on the previous tickets and now you really want a drop ticket, you might be pretty bummed out. So we made sure to include that. And if you go to the website and you're, you already hold some other tickets, there's a very simple option to swap them into uh, drop tickets at their face value. Yeah, I think there so. was somebody talking about the arbitrage opportunity. There was still some some good deals on some of the legacy tickets, and then you could take them and swap them and get the drop tickets yeah. at a discounted price. Yeah, yeah, that's probably true. I would not be surprised. There's a there's a lot of uh, good alpha around the tickets. If you're mm -hmm. staking friends and you want to monetize that, you just start getting tickets and selling them to people who want to buy them. And 
yeah. you end up getting an APR that's hard to calculate, but it's it uh, it can it can be really good, better than a lot of those yield farms out there. So um, I know that there was some consternation around uh, hunt hunt one and then hunt two and some friction. People some people might not have wanted a hunt two because the value of the original hunt um, you know could be diluted, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You introduce new supply, and there's that that frictional point. Is there going to be yeah. any uh, demarcation between, you know, Avogachis from the first haunt versus Avogachis from the second haunt? Yeah, so very good point. And the first time haunt two went up for a vote, it actually didn't reach consensus and didn't happen. And, mm -hmm. you know, at the time I was I was endorsing the idea of a second haunt. This was a few months ago. So was I because I didn't get the first one. So I was with you. Oh. Yeah, yeah, there was a lot in the community. There was a reason for it. Like a lot of people were like, I just want an affordable Avogachi and mm -hmm. I want to play the game with you guys. But um, there is, there's kind of the collector and then the player. And so trying to get consensus uh, took some took some time, but now it seems to be almost unanimous that people are like, yeah, we're, we see what's coming and, and Polygon, the user base has grown so much. It's like, we need a few more Avogachis out there in the world. Um, yeah. There is some differences though. So um, during that uh, initial vote that got shot down, there was a simultaneous vote happening on should Haunt 1 Avogachis have a, a, uh, a unique NFT gifted to them that no other Avogachi can have. And it's, it's a wearable. So if you go in, I didn't do show on screen just now, but you can you know, have a head wearable, a body wearable, a hand wearable. There's one slot we've never used yet called the background slot. And actually, that is a slot that can be used for backgrounds for your Avogachi to kind of signal whatever you want. It could just be like a postcard uh, from a vacation in the realm, or it could be an exclusive, non-transferable Haunt 1 background that is only for the, the Haunt 1 uh, Avogachi. So that got voted as a yes. We've been working on that, and... Uh, we really are ready to go. So we're just going to be having some news on that very soon. And all the Haunt 1 Avogachis will definitely have their um, exclusive backgrounds ready to equip before Haunt 2 starts. Cool. That is uh, definitely happening. Cool, yep. cool, cool. And then we'll, we'll re redo the UI a little bit on the website so that it makes super clear that there is the metadata like hardwired on chain that says this is a Haunt 1 or a Haunt 2. We'll make sure that's displayed on the dashboard nice and clear. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, all right. So you know, now you've got your you know, continue on in the in the gachi verse. So you have these parcels of land. They're earning you resources. You're building structures that allow you to do different things. You guys also have just aesthetic structures there too, as well, where it's yeah. just just for the look of the land. Yep, we really want to have it at a point where um, user created content plays a huge role. Okay. So. We think of, you may notice we had a lot of designs and stuff in those uh, mock shots of what we're working on, but we also want it to be kind of like we're framing the world and the, the community is going to fill it in, right? They're going to create the world. So if you are uh, talented or you want to hire somebody who's talented to create your vision of an installation, uh, that's totally going to be something that you should be able to do. So you'll be able to take your crafting tools and probably craft some sort of uh, the recipe will say, you know, uh, 10 FOMO and three of this, and then you can create your own 3D objects or aesthetic NFTs. Awesome. So, awesome. Uh, what, what are liquidators? Cool. So this is probably uh, the best thing about the realm. The thing I'm personally most excited about is I mentioned there's this antagonist or a competitive element outside of the Citadel. And this is the area that is wild and roamed by liquidators. And liquidators, L-I-C-K, they have really big tongues. Mm. The liquidators are your competition for yield. So yeah. the uh, there's a couple of great things about them is their looks. They're like little robots with tongues. But um, also the fact that they they are an NFT that you can play. If you don't have an Avogachi, maybe after Haunt 2, Avogachis are still $500 a piece at the floor. It's, you know, it's the floor price. Mm -hmm. We want everybody to be able to get in the realm and have a role to play. And so a real game always needs an antagonist anyway. Why not choose sides and you can play on that side? So the liquidator, we're turning the idea of scarcity uh, on its head and saying, 
you can have a liquidator just about any time you want if you're willing to do something. Like so, you basically earn a referral ticket, mm. and boom, you can cash it in for a liquidator. So it's free to play. So everybody can get a liquidator. It doesn't cost anything. Um, and then once you have it, you will do an on-chain transaction to insert it into the world. And that transaction will actually burn the liquidator token. So your, your liquidator is now gone. Um, I mean, it's a one-time use NFT is what I'm trying to say. You've got a one-time use NFT that has uh, possibly faucets and, and airdrops and all sorts of ways to increase adoption. You want everybody to have one, try it out and have access to the world. And then you get your liquid air. What do you do? Their role is to basically play a very cool 3D massive version of, of Pac-Man where um, there's loose yield floating on the surface of the world at any time, at any point in this massive virtual world. And you guys are hunting for it. So, and so are the Avogachis. So it's a big game of tag. It's a big Easter egg hunt, however you want to frame it. These liquidators enter the world. You run around with your one-time use liquidator, gather as much yield as you can, bring it back to the save point, deposit it into your wallet before an Avogachi comes by and wrecks you. That's pretty much the, that's the game flow. So it's a, it's a high stakes game of, of get, catching that Alchemica. And um, if you do that enough and you play a few times, I, the ideal is you have enough Alchemica that you can upgrade, get yourself an Avogachi, get yourself a parcel. Mm -hmm. So you can start doing the passive farming as well. Because cool. the way it works is if you're passively farming, and this is a rough for demonstration number here, but let's say you farm 10, uh, 10 FOMO, then nine FOMO will go to you, but one FOMO will go to a different wallet that redistributes it randomly on the surface of the world. And so that's why the Easter eggs keep, pop keep popping up. Like the more farmers there are, the more is being re redistributed to the wild. And that is a great reason for everybody to go out and explore the world and, and take a walk. My Wait, how many, are, we, are we just going to have, is this just massive amounts of liquidators just running around? I mean, is that the, <laughs> is that the idea? I mean, I love, by the way, I love the terminology, yeah. man, the interest bearing tokens mm -hmm. and the liquidators. Uh, it's awesome. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the liquidators, you know, we, we as pixel craft, I think, and eventually the DAO, we'd like to hand this over to them. Mm -hmm. um, we will have kind of a control on the faucet. So if we're pushing in the beginning, everybody wants to come check out the game. I imagine the faucet will be pretty wide open. There'll be a lot of airdrops. Everybody will be able to hop in. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a social element. If, if you want to type and chat with each other, you can have that. So I imagine raid parties of like a hundred liquidators getting together and like, you know, fighting and, and chasing for, for Alchemica. Um, but if if at any point, you know, the, the amount of uh, Avogachi is more fixed, like the, the DAO is the only one that can vote to have another haunt. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to keep that in balance to some extent. But as the devs, we really want to be as hands off as possible. So we'll try to find an equilibrium and, and tweak that amount of liquidators supply um, as lightly as we can, because we don't want to be messing with people's money. And I mean, the yield yeah. does have a value. So, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, no that's axe another God. That's, that's another topic I want to talk about here in just a minute. But before I get there is, so you've got your Avogachi, he's decked out, you got your parcel in, he's farming for you. He's going outside the Citadel one day and roaming the Badlands with, with the liquidators. Uh, mm -hmm. What, what is that, what is the gameplay gonna, what do you have in mind for the gameplay? Is it going to be like a, like JRPG where it's like you pop up into a screen and you're, you're battling like with some set moves based on your statistics, or is it going to be more like automated as you, as you walk through, you run into somebody, the encounter happens, and then it's done. I mean, what what, what do you yeah. guys have in mind right now? It's it's more of a, what's the right term? It's it's not a turn-based, like, Pokemon style. It's like a, a slasher. Like, you you actually, like, have a, a – you equip your wearables. Yeah. And different – we're experimenting with this right now. It's so fun to be – have my – like, I'm just watching, sneaking in, and seeing what they're building. Yeah. And they've got like different wearables now. They're deciding like, well, is that a range weapon or is that like a handheld slasher weapon? And so you got the, you know, the the grenades, the archery, and you're you're gonna go around and if you catch that liquidator, you can you can, you know, leave them leave them in bad shape pretty quick. So when you so, catch him, do you get everything that he had farmed uh, up until that point? Do you get to get yes. take it from? And likewise, if a liquidator somehow they're they're going to be kind of weaker, but we're we're like tweaking maybe there's like the, a gang of them. 
right? Yes, if they gang up and they capture a gachi, oh my goodness. Like, oh, no. uh, I hope the gachi didn't have too much alchemica on them. They won't get the wearables, but they'll get the uh, any alchemica that was in his uh, pocket at the time. Okay. So it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be pretty good. All right, um, so I have to ask you about the arena because that, that to me, like, when I played games, I always like to play Diablo on hardcore, right? I mean, like when the character died, that was it, right? That, that was the exciting part of the game for me. I mean, how uh, how on edge is this thing going to be, this arena going to be for these high-level players? Yeah, yeah. So the arena is for the high-level players. It's like the Coliseum. Mm -hmm. And if you want to go in there, um, there's going to be weight classes based on your spirit force. So if you have um, the minimum balance, you know, your lightweight, and you can, you can have a – a battle in there. It's basically gachi on gachi battles in there. It's not for the liquidators. Okay. And um, there might be even some different battle mechanics that people can try out in there. And then um, what we'd like to do is also offer like event based events there, host events. And then you get the celebrity gachis that we anticipate will come to be. And these celebrity gachis with the big yield, they mm -hmm. can come in and I'm in favor of it, like you said, all or nothing. Like I want to see, uh, you know, let's say ten thousand, maybe that's too much. Let's say a thousand dollars worth of yield, uh, mm -hmm. spirit force, and that's your health bar. So if yeah. it goes down to zero, mm -hmm. not only uh, do you lose all your yield, but your avagachi could potentially just be like suicided. <laughs> like, sorry for lack of a better word. But yeah, we we do have that method where you can burn your NFT, sacrifice your your avagachi or wow. transferring its XP to somebody else. So what we, I would love to, you know, see some real uh, brawls, some serious brawls in the Coliseum. Man, this and is what spectator I'm, sport. This is, this is what I'm most excited about because, you know, in Diablo, when you when you died and that was it, maybe your gold flew out of your body and that was it. Mm -hmm. And somebody, come, but gold had no, you know, real value. And this is gonna be like, you know, real, real loot oh, that's, yeah. you know, could be flying. All the, the things you guys can do to make this really exciting with actual mm -hmm. value at stake is gonna be like gladiatorial. It's gonna be really Seriously. awesome. Yeah. That's that's the idea. Yeah. With yeah, when it falls out, you're like, that's actual link, like, or that's Ave tokens or ghosts. Yep. So it's gonna be very, very interesting. Okay, cool. So um, you know, I this is going along and I apologize. I hope you have more time. I, I wanna wrap up, start wrapping up though. Um yeah. so away from the game mechanics um who's y'all's basically target uh market like is there uh obviously it's crypto natives first but you know mm -hmm. is there a demographic or somebody you had in mind when you made the game that you wanted to appeal to yeah um a few different i think it can appeal to a few different segments of players and people um but initially we are more focused on crypto natives, we, you know, you often hear about, well, I want to abstract the blockchain away and we mm -hmm. want to get, you know, your grandma to play a crypto game. And we think that's, there's really no point in chasing that right now. When um, the latest stats on MetaMask are there's over 5 million monthly active users on MetaMask alone, mm -hmm. multiple wallets outside of that too. There's plenty for that community right now that we can serve to them. And they're much more likely to engage and check out the game. So yeah. The, the Polygon user base, the Ethereum community, that's who we're building for first. But our roadmap, we definitely have that chasm and we want to cross it to mass adoption. And so that's where those liquidators come in. That's where very casual based gaming mechanics come in and why we're hiring people that have worked at Capcom and, and uh, arcades and like real, you know, playable mass adoption type of experiences. So in the longer run, in the midterm, uh, I do see the realm, the Gashiverse realm, being that potential way to bridge and bring in a much wider audience of just gamers. So, you know, the play to earn game economy, I think 2021 is a turning point. You're, if yeah. you're still making games a few years from now and there's no play to earn aspect, no ownership. Um, we'll survive. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah. we want to be at the the spearhead of that. And, and um, I think the Gashiverse realm stands to be uh, the first, like, I mean, Axie Infinity is already mapped. Like, it, it's all to scale, right? The money and the capital flowing there and, and the amount of players they're pulling is amazing. Mm -hmm. I think it's just the beginning of a, a wider entire industry where much akin to, I think, about, about the mobile gaming space and how that started. 
And originally it was kind of niche and it was like, oh, mobile phones aren't that good and it wastes my battery and uh, how do I get these games? And now look at it, it's bigger than PC gaming and video console gaming combined. It's it's like everybody has games on their phone. Like, so let, let me ask you, like, uh, I, oh, I have to admit this. I don't think, you know, I, I played uh, Maple Story and I played Diablo and there's a couple other games. And, I, and every time I inevitably, you know, I, ashamed to admit it i hacked and bought it uh you know i i part of me enjoyed actually writing the the bot and the script more <laughs> more than playing the game but eventually you guys because there's real economic value at stake before it was just for you know cred i wanted to have the best items in the game but now you have real economic value at stake like have you thought about i mean the incentives to try to you know uh i guess uh bot or hack or you know use other advantages is it's really high you guys you know, this is going to be a constant struggle for you guys. Have you thought about that quite a bit? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's um, getting security right for the servers, for the on-chain aspects. Mm -hmm. So much of the game is on-chain that I think we have a big advantage there as opposed to um, leaning on other aspects. But then there are parts that, you know, we're going to have to have super secure. And that's why we're bringing in the best talent we can. We just announced yesterday we've got the C former CTO of CoinMarketCap coming in and what does, what does that mean and why we bring him in is he basically took coin market cap from the key growth years when there wasn't really anything like in it arrived at a top 100 he was the one doing the apis and all the back end stuff to secure that whole system so um him among many others on the team that have been with us for the last six months are constantly working on how to scale this game so that we can have ten thousand players simultaneously in the realm all at once and how it can be scaled securely. And um, I'm quite so confident in, we're gonna do well on, on both of those. Cool, so, so, so in DeFi, you know, you always have the smart contract risk, which, you know, before you ape into a pool, you know, or a project, you, you glance over the code and hopefully everything's right that, you know, doesn't scream immediate rug pool. You know, but yeah. the, 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 more, the more difficult ones are the financial attacks, right? That people use the, you know, the code as it was meant to be used and they can, you know, manipulate mm -hmm. it and gain an outcome. There's this new token that I think just launched called the Yield Guild uh, Gamers. And yeah. and what these guys are yeah. doing is basically they're looking ahead to all the games that are going to have yield, uh, playable yield in them. And they're, you know, everybody in the token basically band together and leverage, you know, the uh, the economic input, the the effort input. How can they do that most effectively in the game to, to get to the top of the leaderboards? So, mm -hmm. you know, these mechanics are things you guys I think are going to have to uh, deal with and I don't know if you've seen their their token yet but I thought it was interesting right before I was looking at this I thought man they're going to get out there and they're going to build uh, they're going to leverage uh, basically communally leverage and build all the structures that let them farm faster and you know so you know there's uh, oh it's true there the, and, and yield guild's awesome I love the the whole program they're doing yeah. and it's just I would say John, you gotta you gotta get your guild started today. Like you gotta start building <laughs> your guild. I'm telling you, the, the <laughs> game, I mean, most of the games don't have like you guys don't have this aspect launched yet, but it's coming, and they're already preparing and strategizing how we're gonna take care of all the yield in these games, and it's gonna be man, it's gonna be ruthless. Yeah. There's gonna be a hundred of these little liquidators from the yield guild running around taking down Avogachus and stealing things, and <laughs> we do, yeah, it's gonna be a little bit back and forth, but um, it's it's. Actually, we've built for guilds in it, the only way to do this kind of stuff is to build for what you know is coming. Yeah. So one of the best installations you're going to want to put on your parcel is called the lodge and the lodge is your guild's headquarters. Yeah. And we haven't released all the details on how it's going to work, but it's super cool and ex in that it can be very exclusive and it yeah. can also be capped. So you can't um, you can't grow past a certain number, but you can grow it quite a bit if you uh, structure it right. But long story short. Yeah, you're gonna to want to have a lodge on your parcel and get your get your team together, rally together, and and have a guild. It's so really the awesome. Yield guild isn't the only guild in town. <laughs> there, yeah, there's gonna be all these little micro communities, and you yeah. never know. NFT culture might have a little lodge there, and you know we'll come I, on and. I sure and do... hope so. Yeah. Well, all right. What else? All right. So let's uh, let's do the roadmap for you guys. Where you've been and where you're going, just really high level as a summary for for the okay. viewers. Yep. So been out about a year now. Uh, the first batch of Avogachis launched March of this year on Polygon. And um, we'll have that second haunt a few weeks from now. We'll have the first pre-sale of Realm, all in the Citadel. 
uh, in September. And then in Q4, probably right around Christmas time, that's when the Citadel itself will go live. And then in Q1 of next year is when the grid will open up and that's when we'll introduce the liquidators. So the liquidators uh, cannot go into the Citadel. I guess that was implied, but I'll say explicitly, that's kind of why the Citadel is safer. So uh, you don't have to worry about the roaming bands of, uh, of liquidators. And that puts a bit of a premium, I guess you would say, on yeah. owning a parcel inside because you, you don't have to deal with that part. Um, yeah. And then there's one other thing I'll mention that is part of our roadmap and part of the game experience, which is the lore and the great battles. So we do have kind of a, a reset button at each point or a milestone throughout this game. So it's not just open-ended and constant back and forth fighting for yield, but at a certain point, there's a great portal in the middle and that houses a certain percent of all the yield being farmed, a very small percent, but it's accruing over the whole play of the game. And when it hits a certain threshold, the protective force field around the Citadel will fall. And it's only at that point that the liquidators can enter the Citadel for a brief period of time and there'll be a great battle. And then if the Avogachis can defend the great portal at that time, then more rewards will go to all the Avogachis. If not, the liquidators just, will, it's gonna be like a redistribution situation. And then the battle's fallout will actually boost the yields in everybody's parcel. Um, so you can deplete your parcel, the yield too, because we said there's a fixed number but then after you um, have this great battle, there's almost like new fertilizer and okay, you, you top up a bit and then the game kind of resets and, and, and moves forward till battle number two. There'll be nine battles total. And then once those nine battles are complete, that'll take two years to play out, I imagine. And then once the, that plays out, instead of having just a sequel and blah, 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 we hope by that point on our roadmap, we anticipate that play to earn gaming is at a whole nother level. Our realm is completely filled completely packed it's time for more parcels but we didn't want to like rug pull our community and be like hey guess what it's three years later we're introducing more parcels now so yeah. we've already put it in the roadmap that there is a um an outer world to what we've seen on that treasure map and that's expansion assuming we uh, succeed as a community and, and filling this world with gotchis and liquidators and yeah. so that's really like 22 23 is like let's grow the world and and uh, it's also in a way a bit of a sequel and we get to see where the lore goes. There's a there's a pass on the map called Shall Not Pass and it's through a few mountains and that is gonna remain closed until the nine battles have completed. So right. uh, we'll see what happens. Awesome, and, awesome. All right, so let's, let's close out with three questions for you. Uh, when you meet new people, what do you tell them you do? What's your description of your job? Um, I'm, a, I'm a game designer. Game design. Yeah. Okay. All right. And how much of a DeFi degenerate are you? Uh, I don't. I haven't checked my DGEN score in a while, but it's. Uh, yeah, I've, I've. I've been in a rug pull or two. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. I've been rugged. All right. Awesome. Yeah, you're not a DGEN unless you've been rugged a few times. Um, yeah. All right. So, and then if you had to put all of your value into one token and hold it for the next five years, what would it be? Ghost. Got it. Awesome answer. <laughs> awesome answer, man. Yeah. Super exciting project, man. I'm pumped as a community member uh, to see what the future holds. All the best of luck and thanks for coming on this evening. Thanks so much. Talk yeah. soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.